gateway to the West. Cardinal Nation. St. Louis, Missouri is the home to some of the most brilliant physicians in the world. These doctors are pushing science to its limits, healing patients in new innovative ways and doing it at the same time they are teaching the next generation of doctors how to save lives. Meet Slucare geriatric physician, Dr. John Morley, who with his team, Dr. Milta Little and Dr. Angela Sampert, have shaped the way geriatric medicine is practiced around the world, changing the quality of life in older patients in ways never before thought possible. This is the Science of Healing. As people get older, things change just as it does with young children. We get more sensitive to drugs, we tend to have changes in our muscle strength, we tend to fall more. A number of things that happen that mean that an older person needs to have some access to a specialist. That specialist is called a geriatrician. Sounds like you've had a rough go, though. I know that you were in the hospital. So you've got to take your Tylenol regularly, okay? okay. You okay. promise. Okay. I promise. Uh, okay. And otherwise, you're going to be really happy. Okay. Anything else going on? Hi. Hi, Dr. Bowles. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Good. You're just here for your regular checkup? Just a regular checkup. My husband had been seeing a physician in his area of need, and I saw how that was maintaining his health so well. He was doing really much better to be normally expected. And as we aged, I thought, hmm, I ought to find someone who beats my needs too. So a lot of times people will say anybody 65 or older would qualify to see a geriatrician, think about geriatrics. Other people would say once you start having some issues that may be a little bit more complicated, then you would see a geriatrician. There's a little bit of controversy there just because there aren't enough geriatricians. She took a lot of uh, information about my history and wanted to see my medication list. Actually made some suggestions at that first meeting that made a, a, a very big difference in the quality of my life. I can go out and walk, I can go to the store, get out of my car, I can go to a theater without feeling I'm going to have to snoop down and lower my head to keep from passing out, which is what I was doing for several years. I was taking a couple of medications that I should not have been taking. The one I needed to drop, which I didn't know, and my par apparently had not been caught by any other person. And when I did that, I immediately had relief from stomach pain that I'd had. I also had been suffering from a lot of dizziness. For years, I had dizziness upon rising. And it's just, oh, that don't worry about it. That's just a part of getting older, they say. Yeah, I mean, well, when I went to Dr. Little, she looked at my meds and she said, you're taking way too much medication for blood pressure. And I said, is it that simple? <laughs> uh, she said, I want you to just keep a chart of your blood pressure, which I did. Brought those uh, logs to her and she lowered my blood pressure medication just as she had predicted she probably would. So immediately, no more dizzy problems. It, it was just amazing to me that she was so tuned in to me uh, as a person and, and as, an, as, a, as a patient, but she wanted to improve my quality of life too, more than just being a doctor to a patient. People who come to me initially either for a consultation or to establish care with me are taking too many medications. And we have to do some negotiating, but we're able to successfully get people off of a lot of medicines and they come back and they're surprised by how good they feel, how stronger they feel, how less fatigued they are. And it really makes a big difference to cut back medications in this age group. A friend of mine, uh, uh, Stephen Fitzgerald in Australia, actually looked at studies that have been done and showed that when you're older, if you are on more than five drugs, the sixth drug will either make you better, it has about a 25% chance of doing that, that's wonderful, but it also has a 25% chance of making you worse. So we have to start choosing drugs as we keep on adding them very, very carefully. And then we have to reevaluate if we give a person an extra drug to make sure it's not doing harm rather than good. I feel much safer within my own self that I don't have the dizzy spells. Um, I was a grandmother taking care of grandchildren and often we would get out of the car, we'd start walking across the parking lot, 
and I would feel, feel this dizziness come on me and I just thought, I can't be dizzy, I'm responsible for these, these children. That's all gone now. I don't have any worries at all whatsoever about feeling dizzy in their presence. We peak somewhere around 30 years of age and from then on all our body systems go down at about 1% per year. So obviously when we're around about 80, we give a drug that in a 30 year old will do no harm is quite likely to do harm in an older person. So it's that interaction of the drug at the same dose in a person who has a different muscle mass, a different fat mass, and when you start to do that, you run into real trouble if you don't adjust the drugs and realize that also drug-drug interaction becomes very important. There are many different ways that one can assess for risk of falls and we call it dual tasking where you have to do a particular task while asked to do something else and it assesses balance and gait and all these different things and it can be really boring. Well, Dr. Morley takes that up a notch and he will dance with his patients. So I need you to dance with me, can you do that? Come on, let's see how well you do. And that's a way of assessing if somebody has good balance, if they have a good gait, if they can follow the different commands, asked to do things like twirling and things like that. And it always breaks the ice. It, it, it eases any attention that might be in the room. It's a lot of fun. Don't look at me like that, Mabel. <laughs> <laughs> but the doctor know I can't dance at all. No, Never and neither I can I. So that makes fly. two of us who are equally bad at dancing. I don't know. Wait, no. wait, but we're going to swing you around. Oh, Lord. Whoa, are you yeah. good? Wow. Oh, got that that is on. magnificent. You are so good. And I kind of like his personality. He always uh, had a way of making you forget whatever you were thinking about it. When you have anxiety, and I have a lot of anxiety, so he'd always say something to make you laugh and forget about it, you know, he was quite humorous, you know, and then he's always ready to dance, and so I kind of liked his personality, that's how I chose Dr. Morley. I dance with my patients for multiple reasons, starting with the fact that my wife refuses to dance with me because I'm just a terrible dancer uh, and I love dancing. My patients on the whole never complain when I dance with them, so that's the number one reason I dance with my patients. Uh, but there are other very good reasons to dance with someone. Many years ago I noticed that when you dance with people, one, it makes them happy, they get alert and feel good, but I can look at how they're moving, whether or not they've got problems with their muscles, whether they've got balance problems, how they're thinking, because when you swirl somebody around, for instance, this requires the brain and the body to work together. And so it's a very good and quick way to actually look at all of those things that often go wrong early in a person, and it's a fun way to do it. Daddy said, I forgot, what, what, what am I trying to do, you know? I said, don't come up forget now, Dr. Ross, because I need you, you know? But he was just kind of make you be more at ease. And it's sort of a, a way that they don't know that they're being tested, so it's really nice. So he's assessing them as they're dancing and also turning, he always turns them. Because older people, you'll hear a lot that they fall when they turn. They'll say, well, I just went to turn and reach for something and I was down. So he assesses their balance sort of as they're turning. I think that the patients love to dance and they, it makes them feel like they're connected, you know, with Dr. Morley and their doctor is really down to earth and I think it helps them open up a little more to him. If a problem is picked up early, it's much better. There was a lawyer that it came in and he was a partner in a practice and his partner, his lawyer partner said, you're just not performing up to speed. I see you're making mistakes on documents. You always seem to be sort of groggy and tired. So he came to see us and we did a memory test and he was actually scoring in the dementia range. His wife had come in with him. So I turned to her and I said, does he have problems uh, breathing at night? And she said, oh, he stops breathing all the time at night. So I said, oh, okay, this is just easy. We sent him for a sleep test. We got him the machine, the CPAP, he wore it. Six months later, he came back. And in fact, his memory was now perfect. That's an example of one totally treatable condition. There are other treatable conditions, hypothyroidism, for instance, B12 deficiency. 
people who are depressed. Simple things that we can work on and reverse the memory loss. In addition to that, there's now good data based on the finger study, which is the Finnish geriatric study, showing that if you have a Mediterranean diet, eat lots of extra virgin olive oil. It's supposed to be a liter a week, and I don't know any American who can do a liter a week. We have to be Spaniards or Italians or Greeks to do that. And in addition to that, do exercise at least three times a week uh, and do something for mental stimulation, whether that's Sudoku, playing computerized games, and then making sure you still socialize. The problem is as we start to have memory problems, we tend to withdraw, and withdrawal is the worst thing you can do. Hearing is actually one of the reasons for memory impairment, and it also can contribute to falls. Anything that um, alters the senses, eyes, vision, or hearing, um, creates a bigger fall risk. And if you have a lot of wax or you have hearing trouble, your balance is often um, off, um, so it increases your fall risk. And then the lack of sensory input, so you know, visual impairment or the hearing impairment, will create a more of a risk for dementia, developing memory problems. Your brain needs that constant stimulation and that input that we get all the time, you know, just without even knowing it. Um, it sort of keeps us cognitively uh, sharp. And so we find that if we can fix some of the hearing impairment or vision impairment, that patients do a lot better in terms of falls and memory. Well, geriatrics is a Johnny-come-lately field. Pediatrics became a full field in 1940. When I entered the field in 1985, there were a handful of geriatricians, and in fact, there was no specialty in geriatrics. I wrote the first geriatric specialty exam in 1988, uh, and so geriatricians are a novel and new phenomenon. Uh, that's actually 10. Yeah. 10, yeah. So you're doing really well. Most yeah. probably better than me, actually. Well, I think geriatric medicine is important to our entire country. Uh, we have health care crises in this country that have a lot to do with how we are delivering health care. And with the increasing population uh, being elderly in this country, we have to have doctors that focus not just on one disease and not just one condition, but rather on the entire person and their quality of life. And that's where geriatric medicine is so important. Geriatrics takes a long time to okay. see people. Stand up and walk for me. That's good, you got up well. Uh, okay, let's just walk over here and turn around. Back. A little unsteady, but otherwise. And my new patient hard. exams are an hour long, and I'm really lucky that it's important to Dr. Morley. You know, he doesn't say you need to make more money, so you need to, you know, see two patients in the time span of one. He lets us take our time, and he wants a thorough us to do a, a good job. You know, so he sees that, and we do what's best. I think. We spend much longer with patients than do general physicians. But unfortunately, when you do that, you don't earn as much money. So geriatricians, a bit like pediatricians, are very underpaid. In a modern day and age where we've gone through a recession, where basically people have large debts coming out of our medical school, geriatrics is not nearly as exciting to do as going into uh, cardiology or endocrinology or one of the other subspecialties uh, and you actually earn less when you do it well than a general physician will learn. We had a little resident panel that I was part of and asking them why did you not decide to do geriatrics and all of them said it's because you don't get paid the same as other specialists. I think that's one of our challenges is um, how do we move the incentives and part of the problem here is our healthcare system has grown up over the decades with really backwards incentives. You make more money if you're a doctor by treating people who are sick rather than spending time with your patients helping them be well. And that's the essence of geriatric medicine is uh, someone who spends time with someone making sure that their heart medication makes sense in light of the medication they're taking for diabetes.
it's kind of a gatekeeper that has a holistic view. And we've got to incentivize with the way we pay doctors to encourage that kind of medicine. In the long run, not only are people going to have better lives, we're going to save a lot of money. So I think until we put more emphasis on quality of care, I think it's not going to change. We are, for the first time, doing more on the prevention side. People now have free preventative care, whether it's a colonoscopy or whether it's a mammogram or whether it's another kind of prevention. We are now taking that into account as an important part of our medical budget because preventing is the most cost-effective thing we can do. And that's one of the things I think that geriatric medicine has always figured out. Um, I think they've always understood that if somebody is not looking at just one part of the puzzle, but rather looking at the person, uh, we're going to have happier and healthier seniors. The holistic approach includes working with a large number of healthcare professionals, social workers, physical therapists, occupational therapists, uh, speech therapists, uh, case managers, and we have to work with all of those people. We also have to work very carefully with specialists. The reason that the teamwork is so important is that uh, one focus will be at the center of the uh, table and that is patient and different doctors from different uh, backgrounds with different expertise can tackle the patient's problem. For instance, we have developed with the cardiologists a clinic for faints and falls. And in that clinic, we've realized that about a third of the older people who fall are actually having syncope because of an abnormal heart rhythm. A lot of patients with fainting spells, dizziness spells, passing out spells, falls, and all of them at some point were categorized under falls. And nowadays we know that they are not just pure falls. And Dr. Morley had uh, envisioned that uh, probably cardiac slow or fast rhythm could be the cause. And in fact, having gone through the faint and fall clinic process, uh, we have come to the same conclusion. At the Faints and Falls Clinic, there's a cardiologist usually there, so that's integral to the actual workup of the fall. And they're the ones that will usually use an implantable device or something to determine if they're having arrhythmias that are undetected. Um, so we definitely need their input to provide the best care and to you know, get to the root of the problem. There's no question that once you take care of the faint, a lot of falls can be uh, avoided. As a result, it will increase the survival of the patients and also sense of well-being and less fracture, less laceration, less bleeding, less hospitalization. The quality of life of the elderly will be completely on a different scale. It is my personal opinion that Dr. Mulvey has changed the lifestyle, quality of life, and overall sense of well-being of uh, elderly patients. The mutual patients that we have are all amazed, thankful to Dr. Moli, so am I, and I have learned a lot from him. He's not just a, a geriatrician. He's an endocrinologist, he's an internist, he's an a geriatrician. So he brings several expertise on the table. Uh, so do the other partner of his. Uh, it's a very comprehensive uh, team. Kind of do some testing here to see how you've been doing. It's been a while since I've done your geriatric testing. So it's questions about four different things that we worry about in older people. One of them is being frail. Are you frail? So we'll go through that. And then sarcopenia, which is loss of muscle mass. And then one on uh, nutrition. And then, of course, everyone's favorite, the memory test. Don't do that one. <laughs> We've developed a test called the Rapid Geriatric Assessment here at St. Louis University. The reason we've developed it is not so much for us to do it because we use more sophisticated testing, but because there are not enough geriatricians. In the year 2000, there were more geriatricians than there are now. So we applied for a major grant from the Bureau of Health Professionals and we're fortunate enough to get this grant that's now allowing us to train 
healthcare professionals, primary care physicians, uh, specialists, but also nurse practitioners, uh, physical therapists, occupational therapists, social workers, anybody who wants to be trained in how to screen for geriatric problems and then what is available to do we, that can be done for these problems. But I want you to put in the times, 12, 1, 2, 3, the hours all the way round, mm -hmm. and then the time at 10 to 11. Okay. Be my guess. 12, start with 12 at the top. So the goal is to find some of these issues before they become a disability, before somebody develops dementia. We want to pick some of these things up so that we can impact them early and make a difference and, and not wait until it becomes a bigger issue. Can you climb up one flight of stairs? Yes, ma'am. This consists of looking at the modern geriatric giants. This is loss of muscle called sarcopenia. It's frailty, and this is frailty before you become disabled. It's Anorexia, as we get older, we can't afford to decrease the amount we eat. We have to maintain our weight. Somewhere after 65, weight loss is bad for you. And then finally, we need to know how you're thinking. So we have the rapid cognitive stimulation test, which is a rapid way to say, are you thinking okay? All of these have easily treatable conditions, so it's not due always to aging. Much of it is not due to aging. These can be treated, and they need to be treated first. And then we have a series of things we can have people do that can actually slow down the process as well. I've had wonderful, wonderful health. Wonderful health. And Kinder is a really spry, you know, 93, 94 year old. Um, she actually has very lo little memory impairment. She's really cognitively intact. Um, she came to me originally because she was having some trouble with back pain. She ha and actually, I think it helps that Dr. Sanford educates me as well when we go. I go to all her doctor appointments with her. And just the light bulb sometimes goes off in my mind. She said, you know, I want to see you get up and go every day because as you get older, once you stop, sometimes you don't get back started again. And that's really important, and I thought, you know, that's right. Once we were able to work on her pain, she felt like she was able to get out more um, with her friends. So her advice to me is very valuable that I'm not overlooking something. You know, I'll go home and I'll, you know, talk to my husband, hey, you know, this went on today. Is there, is there something I'm not seeing here? Or just give me somebody else's opinion. I don't want to make decisions for her by myself and always be second guessing. So when I talk to Dr. Sanford, I feel like it's a couple girlfriends talking. No different, quite honestly. <laughs> you know, that's why we love our daughters because they tell us what to do, and they've forgotten that we brought them up, and we know at least as well as they do. See, right? I came with her sisters. <laughs> uh -huh. I gave her that, you know, somebody to look after them, you know, and she just took over. The problem: children, first of all, are very poor at recognizing that parents have memory loss. They tend to let it go for years, and they say, "Oh, that's just mom or dad." You know, they just a little old and stuff so the first thing you've got to recognize is have people screened on a regular basis with the rapid geriatric assessment we're now providing screenings on a regular basis at St. Louis University and in the community point out at St. Louis University, we have most probably done more teaching of medical students and residents in geriatrics than maybe 90% of universities around the country. Those physicians are going to be able to do a lot to make the difference. But for the rest of people, their physician has no training, does not know what to do, and geriatricians can make you stronger, they can make you think better, they can make you less depressed, and they can make you really enjoy the last years of your life. Well, Dr. Morley is amazing. Uh, Dr. Morley has been uh, the doctor for a number of my family members, including my husband. He is not someone who is anxious to grab a prescription pad. He is more interested in talking to you, learning about your cognitive abilities, learning about your quality of life, and then doing the best he can to, in fact, remove medicines from your regimen so that you are not captured by the pill containers. Uh, and so he combines the time that you need to spend with a patient with science-based medicine. And, um, and besides that, he's a funny guy and he's a character. 
And so I wish we could clone Dr. John Morley because our country would be healthier and happier if we could. Dr. Morley has national and international reputation. Uh, he's given lectures all over the world. I feel that Dr. Morley has made a big impact in the field of geriatrics. He, I think, is probably better known outside of the city of St. Louis for all the things that he has done internationally. And if I travel in geriatric circles, everybody knows Dr. John Morley. And so it's great to be able to work with somebody like that. I mean, he's amongst the preeminent clinical geriatricians of his time. I don't want to be too nice to him because again, I usually criticize him because we're friends, but he's an outstanding caliber in individual. And as I said, I specifically came to work with him because of his reputation. And John has visited here many times and he's had a major impact on our research program here. You know, you, you have a role model and uh, he's very well known internationally and uh, he's worked through the uh, International Association of Gerontology. Uh, so you have a, a person of that stature uh, feeling very passionate and keen and caring uh, about this area. Uh, and that, I, I think, is uh, the, the most important thing. Uh, you, you have lots of uh, very good research workers, but they look at the subject as an academic field. And uh, you, you don't get the sense of caring. Very difficult to have people who, who do both. We are doing this because we can make a big difference in the lives of older adults. We can help to keep people independent, keep them in their homes, and then when a problem does arise, we can make a difference to quell it to some extent and keep the effects from being too severe. Because it is so rewarding to you know, see these elderly patients and their families, you can really develop a, a long-lasting relationship. And I take care of many husband and wife teams, and you know, I know the children, and I can see them through their different phases of life. <laughs> Look at me like that, baby. <laughs> it's very nice when you can take a population of people and provide that one to two percent improvement. That is huge when you're older. You know, one percent improvement for you is, well, you had a bad night last night. One percent improvement for a 95-year-old who's having memory problems is the difference between being able to stay at home or have to go to a nursing home, or in the nursing home being able to interact with people or spending most of their day just sitting in a chair and not talking.